All right. We're going to go ahead and start this presentation as uh, anybody else who needs to filter in does so. So welcome to a bird's eye view finding C.J. Dyer presented by Ed Dobbins this Thursday, 6 to 7 p.m. We're going to have some fun and review some history. So let's get started. So welcome and introductions are of course, going to be done by me, Isabel Cazares. I'm a librarian and archivist at the Arizona Heritage Center at Papago Park in Tempe. Uh, just supporting us tonight will be Nathan um, from Samorsky, registrar at the Arizona Heritage Center as well. Uh, if you haven't come down and seen us at the Papago Park uh, Tempe location, it is really beautiful and we'd love to see you. Okay helpful reminders during the presentation here. We would ask you to please use the chat box for comments and questions. We will get to a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And because the number of participants here tonight, we encourage everybody who's not a presenter to keep your video off and remain on mute so we can have a great time and a good recording for those who can't make it tonight. On that note, it is being recorded tonight. So if you weren't aware of that, this is just a reminder that that's happening. And there is gonna be a link for the recording and a survey that will go out at the end of the pre presentation. Um, and then after a couple of days, you'll get that from us. Now, if you've enjoyed this, or if you enjoy this program tonight, please consider becoming a member. You can go to azhs.org org slash membership. And we'd love to have you participate in more um, activities with us. On that, we just want to remind you the Arizona Historical Society's mission statement is to connect people through the power of Arizona's history. We are here to make sure that history is around for everybody. And a reminder that the Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit organization and a state agency established in 1864. We have four different locations. So we're all over this state, as well as uh, here to help you phone, email. Uh, so definitely check us out. We collect, we preserve, we tell the story of Arizona's past through museum exhibits. We've got our, our Arizona's Place in Space right now going on, libraries and archives, historic sites, educational programs, and the Journal of Arizona History, which you haven't checked out. It's really amazing. So that's just saying, stay connected. Become a member, sign up for our email newsletter, follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Order a license plate, it's really cool. It's a rockin' monsoon plate. You can use that and maybe hopefully we'll have our own little rain dance if enough people buy it. Um, so visit azhs.org today if you wanna learn more about us and stay connected. So without further ado, may I present our future speaker for tonight, Ed Dobbins. I put a simple explanation here, but this is not really all he is. He is an Arizona history researcher and writer because that is part of his hobby, but he has spent decades being an audiologist and that is an amazing career. But even before that, his interest in history, he spent four years as an, in archeology span studying all these amazing things. So I love the fact that we have a speaker who has really sunken himself into education research and come back to his hobbies of Arizona history and is here to share a really amazing story that is still developing out there today. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to Ed Dobbins. Let okay. me stop sharing and you can start presenting. Okay, I might as well share here. Absolutely. Get that back going. Oops, I can't see the. Uh, hang on. Oh God, I can't see my. Uh, Do you need the presentation button, Ed? 
I think it's up there at the top of your screen. I know it's it's hard with that bar. I, I yeah, I can't get <clears throat> to where I want to get to uh, with the bar in place there. All right. Um, let me see. I think I it's, think Control P makes you a present. I mean, yeah. I, uh, I think so. Control P. I believe so. Nope. Nope. I apologize. That's print. Cool. Uh, oh, here we go. There oh, we go. perfect. Hey, this happens to everybody, right? A little bit of presentation lingo on Zoom, but hey, we're going to get ourselves right. rolling now. All here right. Once more, Ed, take it away. All right. Here we go again. All right. So thank you very much for the in introduction, Isabel, and for the opportunity to talk about C.J. Dyer. And uh, Dyer was a pioneer Phoenix artist uh, who's best known for his 1885 bird's eye view that, that we see here. But he also created many other maps and sketches in his 30 year career as a surveyor, draftsman, and an artist. Until very recently, however, there's, there's been very little known about Dyer. Very little has been uh, published on him or research done into his life. So tonight we wanna go over, uh, we're gonna present a brief biography of Dyer uh, with a special attention paid to his bird's eye views. On the left here is his photo. This is the only photo known of, of Dyer. And this is only recently rediscovered about a, about a year, year and a half ago. And uh, it, it comes from the archives of Olivet College in Michigan, where Dyer went to school between 1866 and 1868. <clears throat> Dyer was born in Jackson, Michigan in 1846 so we figure this, that he gave this photo of himself to the school either while he was a student or right after he left. So he'd be in his early 20s uh, in this photo. His 1885 view of Phoenix is probably from, probably familiar to everyone here. Uh, and it's a very important uh, piece of art for the, for the history of Arizona. And it's appeared in many publications and on many products, including souvenirs like t-shirts and coffee cups and, and so on. And it's a very attractive and, and a detailed view of life in the 1880s, but it's, it's only one of the six bird's eye views that, that Dyer did in his career. Of those six, five of them were done here of locations in Arizona. And of those five Arizona locations, four of them are from Mar Maricopa County. And these, the, the four views that Dyer did of Maricopa County uh, date from 1885 to 1893, and they show the rapid agricultural and urban growth that took place at that time. And Dyer supported this growth, growth and was associated with Im immigration efforts that were aimed at bringing in farmers from out of state. He also worked on two water control projects and events which uh, which occurred to him during those projects are actually re reflected on his final 1893 bird's eye. What is really remarkable about Dyer is that he accomplished all these and many other things with a pretty significant vision loss. Dyer en enlisted in the U Union Navy in 1864 and was assigned to a ship off the North Carolina coast. In, uh, the last week of December of 1864, he was on a duty uh, that lasted all night, moving munitions from one ship over to another. And he said that the, uh, the weather that night was terrible, it was cold and rainy and, and a bad storm. And he claims that beginning that night, uh, he caught a very bad cold or some kind of virus. And he started having a lot of different symptoms which lasted his whole life. And we see the symptoms up here, they included eye pain and headaches and vision impairment, loss of vision. It wasn't until about 20 years later when Dyer uh, applied for a, uh, for a disability pension fr from the Navy that he received a diagnosis. This is kind of a, a generic diagnosis of disease of the eyes. But at this time, he was also tested. His vision was tested for uh, acuity. And in the left eye, it was found that he had about 20 to 40% of normal vision. In the right eye, they were not able to do any testing. He was able to see light through, through the right eye, but he couldn't make out any, any details of the, of the letters and, and figures on the chart. 
So he, that's a that's a pretty significant vision loss. Uh, he was given glasses at the time that he got out of, out of, out of the Navy. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have any test results with his corrected vision, although we're sure that uh, it, it helped his left eye. But everything that, that you're going to see that he did, uh, we can kind of assume that he probably wore eyeglasses while, while he was working. In 1870, Dyer was listed in the Jackson, Michigan census as being an assistant surveyor. In 1873, he landed his first uh, job in, in commercial art, uh, working for a company that made county atlases. And county atlases at the time were, were popular in the Midwest and in the East. And they were uh, groups of uh, an artist and surveyor and assistant and salesperson would get together and go to a, a, a county and do sketches of the farms and biographies and histories of the area and then uh, put, it, put it together in a book and sell them to the residents of, of the county. Dyer worked uh, in, in the Midwest, in Ohio, and uh, Michigan and Ontario for between 1873 to 1877. And then at that time, one of the other artists that he worked with decided to move to, to Northern California and start his own um, county atlas firm. And he invited Dyer to come along and Dyer was willing to do that. In fact, he hoped that the change in climate would, would help out the symptoms that, that he had uh, with his eyes and, and the headaches and so on. So we moved to Northern California. Uh, they were based in Oakland. Uh, but he spent a lot of time in uh, Napa County and the other counties uh, adjacent to that. And he worked uh, in total in the County Atlas uh, field from 1873 till about mid uh, 1880. And at that point, he left the County Atlas people and decided to begin doing things on his own. And at this point, of course, he didn't, he didn't have a job. So in looking for a way to make a living, he came out in late 1880 with his first bird's eye view, which was of Napa City, California, published in fall of, of 1880, and published uh, as a lithograph on a 31 inch by 20 inch sheet of, of paper. This was Dyer's in, in introduction to the bird's eye uh, view industry, which was pretty popular in the 19th century. And just as just kind of a, a general definition of uh, bird's eye views at this time, they're considered to be, uh, they were, would have been printed on separate sheets uh, measuring 20 by 30 inches or, or, uh, or more. And they show a view of uh, an elevated view, usually of an urban area. And using that definition, there were 5,000 or more bird's eye views which, which were published in North America uh, from the end of the Civil War to a little bit past the turn of the century, with the peak point being in the 1870s, 1880s. So Dyer was getting into the field right at the, its uh, peak point. In many cases, the bird's eye views were made under the same kind of a system they made the county atlases. And that was small teams of artists and assistant and, and salesmen would go from city to city in the Midwest and, and do the drawing and send it out to, to, uh, to have it printed, go to the next city, and then come back and deliver the uh, printing. Dyer, on the other hand, does not appear to have ever worked on, on a team for his bird's eye views. It doesn't even appear that ever used an uh, assistant. And once he moved to Arizona, he really only left twice in, in over 20 years. So he, uh, most of the views that you see appear to be his work uh, all by himself. One thing I understand about the bird's eye views is that they are perspective drawings using, uh, using techniques of drawing that have been known for several hundred years. Um, <clears throat> in the West, the drawings were often based on whatever available grid map of the town or a plat map was, uh, was, was, was available. And the artist would take the map and, and uh, redraw it into so that it had a perspective to it so that it showed some depth and then walk the entire town uh, and, and sketch every building uh, in, in its location on each block and fill in some, some details. And then later go back and, and put it all, all together. And in, in the perspective from a view, whatever height and angle that the artist wanted to imagine that the uh, view would look like. My point of saying that is that bird's eye views uh, in the industry, all these uh, many bird's eye views were not done using 
balloons or building a tower or going to the nearest uh, hillside. That, that really would have not have been very cost effective. So they're, they're uh, pretty straightforward for respective drawings. So early in 1881, uh, Dyer sold out of his Napa City view and he found that he had about $1,100 in the bank, <clears throat> which apparently was quite a bit of money at the time. So he set aside his, uh, his art tools and decided to go prospecting for gold in Arizona. Uh, and he and a partner wound up in the Kirkland Valley area of Arizona in 1881. And sure enough, they, they, they actually found a uh, gold bearing quartz vein uh, ledge with a, a quartz vein in, in Kirkland Valley. And, and they worked that, that claim for a, at least a year, possibly as much as one and a half years. Finally, the, the claim petered out and uh, Dyer found himself, he, he moved to Prescott, uh, apparently not having very much money and, and jobs or any contacts to get work. So he decided to uh, uh, do another bird's eye view. And that's the 1884 Prescott bird's eye view came out in May of 1884 on a 30 inch by 20 inch sheet of paper, which he sold for $1.25 each. It's a very nice view. You would see it looking to the Northeast. Off in a distance here would be Fort Whipple. This is a pretty, uh, this, we could use this view to, to see some of the con conventions that were used in, in, in the bird's eye view industry and some of the conventions that Dyer uh, used. The first one is that these views are always a very idealized version of, of the city. Uh, they're always done on a day with nice weather, kind of fair and, or part, partly cloudy. You never see a view that's, that was done during a heavy rainstorm or anything. Uh, and the town itself generally looks nice and neat. We'll see here that all these roads are dirt roads, but the edges are nice and crisp and clean. You don't see any spillover of the dirt and, and you don't see any wagons and horses or horse and buggies going down the road with, uh, with a cloud of dust following them. Um, also, there's uh, plenty of odd houses down in here. They're not really highlighted and there's a town dump around here somewhere. But the idea of these was really to present a, a very idealized view of a nice place to live. These again were made for sale and most of the people who bought them were the people who lived in the town. And they bought them for home pride. They bought them because they were attractive and they, and they framed them and uh, hung them in, in, in their house. The second con convention that this shows here, if you take a look at the view, you'll see that your eye really goes to the, to the center portion here with the, the courthouse and the, and the uh, green. And because these are perspective drawings, that means that the artist has total control over the perspective of everything in that drawing. So he can draw it straight as it is in reality or he can pick and choose certain places to exaggerate or to minimize as he wishes or has some reason to do it. So here Dyer has uh, exaggerated the courthouse and the green in the middle of town. See this a little closer. We'll see that uh, the, it's like a, a two and a half story building. You see the, the top level, the, the top of the first story of the courthouse is taller than the two story building across the street or just in looking at the buildings uh, around the courthouse, you see the courthouse is really way out of scale. And, he, and Dyer did this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, brick, brick buildings at this time out west were considered to be very modern buildings. Um, so the, I think Dyer wanted to show that Prescott was a nice modern town. It wasn't made of adobe or, or false wood, wood fronts. They, they were really up to date and had nice buildings. And also, of course, Prescott was the, uh, the, the seat of government for the territory and having an official government building here, I think, uh, showed uh, the importance of, of the town. And all that was uh, done by means of simply ex ex exaggerating that, that feature. Finally, a third convention that we want to look at, look at are these uh, little pictures of businesses here, uh, the, of buildings. And these are private businesses. These are advertisements. Uh, Dyer would have gone to the individual business owners and proposed to them that he would put a drawing of their business on the map and where the building was on the map, he would put a number and that number would correspond with, uh, with a legend here that would give the name of, of the business. So this is actually how the bird's eye view artists, I believe made most of, the, of, most of, their, most of their profit uh, by selling advertising to the uh, local business uh, people. 
uh, vignettes that show churches and government buildings uh, uh, certainly were not charged. That that would have been part of the of the town. He, he, he made his business off of off of the um, merchants in town. Several years later, Dyer was uh, reminiscing about his early days in Arizona, and he mentioned that this one bird's eye alone, uh, he made a profit of nine hundred dollars which seems like a lot of money in 1884. And I guess it was because once, once again, uh, Dyer decided that he could set aside his uh, artwork and go prospecting again for gold. This time he had another partner rented some steam arastras and they went over to the Hacienda River Valley the, along the Hacienda River. And they, and they uh, crushed the ore from uh, some of the mines that were uh, uh, along the river either for the miners who were there didn't want to take the ore into town or perhaps on, um, on abandoned mines. This uh, second venture didn't seem to be, didn't seem to work out quite as well as the first one did. And about six months later, we find that uh, Dyer is in Prescott for a, for a short time. <clears throat> and then he decides to move on to Phoenix in 1885. And once again, he finds himself, doesn't really have the contacts uh, for his business. He doesn't have an employer but he knows how to at least generate some money. And that, that's the source of his 1885 bird's eye view of Phoenix. This is, of course, his, his best known view. And this came out in uh, late October, early November of eight, 1885. It was printed on a, a 32 inch by 22 inch uh, piece of, of paper. And we locally, of course, re regard this as a very important um, bird's eye, because it tells us a lot about our past. It tells us what was going on here in the mid 1880s. But among scholars who, who, who research bird's eyes, who use them in their research, they also consider this to be one, one of the most important bird's eyes, or at least one of, the most, uh, one of the most attractive. They really like the way it's drawn. They really like the use of the colors in here. Uh, and the, the way that the uh, inserts in that little re rectangle just kind of lined up, they're kind of tucked into the corners and the use of the round medallions. And most of all, they like the use of the oval here. Uh, so this is kind of a, this is something that uh, no one else had done in the bird's eye uh, view field until Dyer came out with, with this oval. So it was new for the bird's eye field, but it wasn't new for Dyer. He had used this particular layout a couple of times, at least twice in 1877. Here we see from the, uh, from the Butte County, California County Atlas. This is a view of, of the Chico racetrack in Chico, California. And again, it has the, the, the central oval uh, for the main scene, vignettes, the little scenes tucked into the corners. It even has a round uh, medallion there in, in, the, in the upper center showing a, a, a famed horse, apparently. So Dyer had a good idea and he had it at least eight years earlier and he used it, we know of at least twice plus the bird's eye three times, and I suspect he probably used it a, a few more times uh, in between too. <clears throat> if we take a look at his bird's eye, uh, the 1885. When we look at it, we see that it's very much focused in on the city of, of uh, Phoenix. It very much, uh, your eye kind of goes right here to the center, the, the densest portion of the urban area. So this is very much an urban view of Phoenix. And Dyer kind of helps us out in order to, to, to get our eye over to that place. One thing are the colors. You see the, uh, the way that they grade it into the lighter area just, uh, just kind of draws your eye. Plus your eye, you're, you're pushed over to it a bit by these darkened areas, which are the shadows of clouds. And it's kind of pushing your eye over to the, the, uh, the central area. Also, Dyer has shortened uh, the size of the city of Phoenix to make the central por portion uh, more obvious to make it a, a bigger part of, of the city. Phoenix at this time was still the size of the original town site, which went from 7th Street on the east side to 7th Avenue on the west side. But 7th Avenue isn't here. If it were here, it would be out here. Uh, Dyer does have a little bit of 6th Avenue there and most of 5th Avenue. So Dyer has shortened uh, the, uh, the city of Phoenix by lopping off part of the, part of the west side which uh, makes the, the central portion of the town look uh, a little bit uh, a little bit larger. 
In terms of the use of his field, the field being the, the whole oval, oval that he had here, again, the, the focus is on urban area because two thirds of that oval uh, is occupied by the, by the urban area and only one third occupied by the lands outside of town, which are, which are, are the farmlands. Now, those of us who live here know that uh, it was actually probably a, a lot of desert out here too. But again, these are I idealized views and you're not gonna see much of the uh, raw desert on any, any one of these, of these views. Now, once again, his use of the, uh, the vignettes in the corners. And these two vignettes here, these two uh, medallions are of the Arizona uh, Canal. The Arizona Canal was finished in June of 1885. And Dyer, in order to publish this, uh, to, to have it distributed uh, to people who bought it in October of 1885, would have had to have finished this drawing to be sent to San Francisco for printing in about June or July of 1885. So the, the canal and this drawing were, were finished right, right around the same time. So we've mentioned that after each uh, bird's eye view Dyer had done previously, he took the money and, and, uh, and did something else, but he didn't do that this time. In 1885, this is where Dyer settles down. This is where his life takes a turn and, and he becomes a, a resident of Phoenix and uh, the owner of a business. In fact, he took the rights to the 1885 bird's eye view and he sold them to his older brother, Derek, for $290. And then he settled in and uh, started doing some advertising to build a clientele, build a business. He was willing to do sketches and maps of whatever you, whatever you needed, mines, canals, dams. And he also bought a house in Phoenix in 1887. Uh, it was located on the south side of Van Buren between Central and First Street. If you were to be a cart cartographer and a draftsman and surveyor, this was a really good time uh, to open up a business as in this in the Phoenix area in the Salt River Valley, as Dyer did, because it was a, a we just poised for very rapid growth for the, for the next few years, and the basis of that was the completion of the Arizona uh, Canal, and uh, like I said, in June of 1885, which opened up tens of thousands of acres of irrigated land, and then two years later, uh, the arrival of the Maricopa to Phoenix Railroad into downtown Phoenix brought a way to, uh, brought a, a connection to the main line of the Southern, Southern Pacific Railroad. So we could, uh, we had a lot more land to produce the agri agriculture product and a way to get it out of town and distribute it to different markets. What, what the area really needed at that point was someone to farm the land. So they went, there was uh, several groups were formed at this time to really, that were really, um, focused on bringing people into the valley and setting them up as farmers and having them uh, produce some, some product. And just between the three years of 1885 and 1888, we know that at least three public organizations were formed. And 1885 was the first time that a territorial immigration commissioner was named, and that was uh, Patrick Hamilton. In 1887, Maricopa County formed their own immigration union. And in 1888, Phoenix uh, formed their uh, Chamber of, of Commerce, and all, all designed to uh, produce literature and bring people in. At the same time, there were a couple of big private concerns that, that owned a lot of land that they wanted to, to sell. And that would have been the Arizona Improvement Company, spearheaded by W.J. Murphy. Uh, this was the successor to the Arizona Canal Company. And Murphy had control of at least 20,000 acres north of, of the river, 20,000 uh, irrigated acres. And then on the south side of the river in 1887, uh, some local businessmen formed the Tempe Land and, and Improvement Company and uh, bought up a lot of land, which they wanted to sell also. And again, just during these first three years after the uh, Arizona Canal was open, 1885-1888, uh, we know of at least a half a dozen brochures that were put out really urging people uh, to come to the, to the, to the Salt, Salt River Valley. Just how wonderful it was, how you, you can grow everything here and your opportunity for riches and everything is, is right here in the Salt River Valley. Dyer uh, entered this, uh, Dyer's part in this, started in 1886 when Patrick Hamilton took ill, the, uh, the territorial com commissioner took ill and Dyer was appointed uh, uh, to fill in for him on a, on a short-term basis. Then in 1887, 
uh, Dyer made a fold-out map of the Salt River Valley for this brochure. And this brochure was produced by the Maricopa County Immigration Union. <clears throat> Excuse me. This came out uh, in 1887. It was it came out to be dis distributed to the uh, to the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, 1887 National in in Encampment, which was held in St. Louis in late September of eight, 1887. So what Maricopa County here is doing is, as we know, early Phoenix uh, residents uh, residents and pioneers, a lot of them were veterans uh, from either side of the Civil War. So here they pr pr produce a brochure and bring it to them, bring it to the GAR convention, which that year was attended by over 4,000 veterans. So they, they, went, they went right to the people that they wanted to bring to the area here. And Dyer's part in that was this map, which I'm not showing, it's just on the background. But the map itself uh, is an important map. It's the first map to show Grand Avenue on a map that, that I know of. And Grand Avenue was bladed by W.J. Murphy in March of 1887. And it's also the first map to, to show the connection of the Maricopa uh, Phoenix Railroad uh, into the proper place into uh, downtown Phoenix, which occurred for the first time in uh, July of 1887. When the agreement was made to build the spur off the main line of the South Pacific in, into downtown, the agreement was that it would go around the east side of Phoenix through Tempe. And that, of course, was was good for the for the uh, people in Tempe, for the for the money people in Tempe, and that's when the Tempe Land and Improvement Company was formed, and they bought up about 700 acres or more in downtown Tempe, everything except for right around the the mill, and then land adjacent to it. Then they bought additional land uh, further south along the railroad in Tempe. The Tempe Land Improvement Company hired a real estate firm uh, known as Schultz and Franklin to sell the land for them. And Schultz and Franklin in turn hired CJ Dyer to do the artwork for their first brochure. And this is their first advertisement or, or uh, marketing brochure put out by Schultz and Franklin in 1888 with this very nice uh, bird's eye view of, of Tempe. This particular sheet, the lithograph sheet is very is about 10 inches larger than the than the ones that, that we've seen so far. But a lot of it is taken up by the text all around there, which was written by Schultz and Franklin and talks about what a wonderful place it is uh, to, to live and we can grow anything here. Uh, you, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to rely on, on mother nature. We have irrigation, you can get water in, anytime that you want and, and so on. Schultz and Franklin claimed that they printed 5,000 of these which is a, a huge amount. The, the, the other bird's eyes that we've shown so far for cities the size of Phoenix and Napa City, uh, they would have been printed in runs of 100 to 300 pieces. So for Schultz and Franklin to uh, print 5,000 pieces is just a huge amount. This, despite that, uh, this is the only copy known and it's owned by the Tempe History Museum. One thing this is uh, interesting, this, this, this is a good example of, of how Dyer uh, made some of his, his bird's eyes, or at least this one. Remember I mentioned that out west, a lot of the cities had plat maps, and this does have a plat map. This is the, in 18, a year before the, the bird's eye here, the Tempe Land and Improvement Company had filed this plat map with the county recorder. And it shows the, the business areas that they owned, and then the, the open land that they owned down here. So pretty much all Dyer had to do to, to get this bird's eye started was to take this map, turn it on its side, and then draw it in perspective. Draw it so that there's some depth to it going out to the, going out to the river here and, and bringing that forward. Just looking at the bird's eye by itself, uh, we can see that Dyer, uh, I think once again, used a little bit of that uh, uh, exaggeration. I believe he made the fields here in the front probably a little bit out of scale. So, while he's selling the, the, the business, the, the commercial area of downtown, he's also he's pushing the ag agriculture area just a, just a bit more. But it, overall, it's a very nice look. And this whole map is, is Tempe. You wouldn't be aware that there, that there was a larger city on, on the other side of, of the river. <clears throat> Schultz and Franklin had kind of a, uh, an unusual way to uh, market this, this brochure and this land. 
Theo Schultz, they, most of their marketing for the first three years was to a fairly small area in northeastern Kansas, about a half a dozen counties. And uh, Schultz went back and forth between Kansas and, and Tempe and would talk to people, pass out the brochure, uh, hold meetings, and then often bring people back to actually show, show them the land physically. And I think, again, his, his marketing strategy, although it, uh, it, it differed from what putting the brochures at the GAR, but in this case, he was going to an area where these people were already farmers. They were, these were ex experienced farmers, and many of the farmers were pioneering farmers. They had been the, the first ones there, the first ones to uh, break ground. So perhaps they figured, well, if they move there once, maybe they'll move again, or maybe their kids will, whatever. So he figured out it was a good market, uh, a good area to market, and they did pretty well. Within the first three years, um, he sold, claimed to have sold uh, over 1,900 acres of land in Tempe to people from Kansas. In 1890, Dyer was back on his own, making uh, his uh, uh, bird's eye view, uh, self-employed. And this is his second view of Phoenix, which came out in, uh, oops, which came out, I believe, in August of 1890. This again is on that large, large sheet of, of paper, just like the Tempe one. But in this case, there's no huge amounts of text around it. This whole thing is, is just the, the, uh, the picture. And so it's, it's actually, it's a very, very large uh, piece. But we can see immediately it's quite different from the 1885. It's uh, viewed from much higher up in the air and taking in a lot more area. Uh, also, it includes the entire, the entire uh, Phoenix area, whereas 1885, we said he cut off part of the original town site. Here it includes the original town site plus all of the additions that have happened since 1885. Uh, Phoenix grew a lot in, within these fi five years. And Dyer actually uh, complained at one point when he, was, when he was doing this map that the place was growing so fast he wasn't able to finish it before something else uh, popped up and he had to put that on his map too. So it uh, shows the, the whole uh, part of Phoenix here, but <clears throat> unlike the 1885, which had two thirds of the whole picture of that oval being city, this view is two thirds of it is open land out here. It's that open Salt River Valley land, it's that open uh, land for agriculture. So it's very different in, in that way. Let's take a look at them side by side. And we see uh, uh, the obvious difference in colors. Again, the colors, it seems, uh, were they were suggested by the artists like Dyer, but at, at the place where they were printed in San Francisco, I think they had the final say as, as to how the colors went. But again, they, they used a uh, nice use of color in 1885 versus this light green or light blue on, on the 1890. The focus that we said, this is very much focused on the urban area right in the densest part. If you're gonna look at this, your eye kind of goes to this kind of a light area here that's along the edge of the urban area, the beginnings of the agricultural area. So Dyer isn't really selling. He's not really focusing in on the city of Phoenix here anymore. He's focusing in on the edge of it and this big open area out here. And that's supported by these two boxes here, which are, uh, this descriptions of what's going on in the view. Once again, this was an uh, innovation of Dyer's. I believe he's the only one at this time who was using these boxes that he put on each, each one of his bird's eye views and the boxes explain what's going on in, in the view. In the 1885 view, it's all, more than half of that is, is all about Phoenix. And it's all about Phoenix being a, a new upcoming and modern city with wide, wide streets and lots of tall shade trees and, and water running along the sides of the street and just a beautiful modern city. In 1890, more than half of the text in here is about all the open area you have if you want to do cattle ranching or if you want to, you want to do farming. There's, uh, you can be a farmer with irrigation. In, in fact, there are thousands of thousands of acres free from the federal government if you want to come out here, move here and uh, farm in the beautiful Salt, Salt River Valley. So very different, uh, very different approaches just within five years. Uh, he's gone from emphasizing the city to emphasizing the area around the city. Dyer's last view uh, was published in August of 1893. Uh, and again, on a bit smaller size sheet of paper. This is a 34 inch by 22 inch uh, view. And as we can see, uh, the view here is the Salt River Valley uh, and then the rest of Arizona. 
So it has a huge scope, whereas the last one was pretty high, had pulled in the whole valley. This one pulls in uh, everything up to northern Arizona. Uh, it's 50 miles wide here, about, uh, from the confluence of the Verde and the Salt on the east to the Hacienda River, just on the other side of the White Tanks here on the west. It's about 50 miles or so. And then from the, uh, from the what was called the Salt River Mountains, the, the South Mountains here, all the way up to this peak there, which is the Bill Williams Mountain. So it turns out that uh, uh, Williams is about due north of down, downtown Phoenix. This particular view uh, is, has been recently discovered. Right? This really hasn't been shown around very much. It was found only two, two years ago at a flea market in Tucson. So it's the only one of it known so far and uh, uh, kind of a surprise that he had more to, to, to uh, come here. But anyhow, the, the, the focus of it, of course, is on the, on the Salt River Valley, the nice green valley. It's not on the cities. We see uh, uh, this big smudge here, that's Phoenix. And then you go up Grand Avenue, you have Alhambra, Peoria, and Glendale. You go over to the east side and you have Tempe and Mesa. But there's absolutely no detail of, of the cities there. Uh, the, the focus here is on, is on the green farmlands of the Salt River Valley. Many of the uh, Many of the uh, brochures that came out at this time a few years earlier uh, referred to the Salt River Valley as the Garden of Arizona. And I think this is a Dyer's visual rep representation of the, of the valley as the, the Garden of Arizona. So we take a look at all four of them here on, on one slide. And, and I think, well, first of all, I think they look, they look really good together. I think they're very, they're very colorful. Uh, and, and enjoyable. And, and once again, that was the point of these. these. These were made to be sold and these were made to, uh, in being sellable, they had to be contemporary. Uh, they had to be, uh, they had to reflect what the people who lived in the town thought of their town for their hometown pride. And we see how that's changed over the years from the urban view city to kind of a mixture between urban and commercial to definitely a lot more importance now on the, on the farmlands around the town uh, than, this, than the city, and to here to uh, just very much the, uh, the full Salt, Salt River Valley. And that's the uh, pro progression that happened in Phoenix over the eight years, and I think Dyer followed that uh, to keep up to date. There are some details on this. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are two text boxes. This text box on the left actually tells you if you want to come out or you want to visit somebody or you want to buy something, then you first you have to locate it. And you'll notice here, this is all laid out in a grid. It's laid out in the township and range system. And this just describes uh, to, uh, how to use the, uh, the township and range system to find something, how to, to find the section and the township and range. And that's uh, what you wanna look at if you wanna come out and see something. On the, the box on the right side, again, it talks mostly about the farming, but it does include the, there are cities in the, in the area. Uh, that are growing and, are, and it would be nice places to live also. The big thing about this view, I think, is that uh, he shows a, a, a lot of water. He shows the Salt River uh, going right, right through the town. Uh, and this is uh, New River and the Agra Freya and the, and the Gila over here. And then he, he includes all of the um, canals which were in, in existence. And Dyer lived here, so he knew what was going on with the uh, um, with the valley. And this was a time when there were many, many schemes to build new canals, new storage, uh, water storage areas, and uh, just flood the whole place or make the whole place farmable. So Dyer also included most of those also. In fact, he actually worked in the field on two of the, of the projects between 1890 and 1895. And he worked up here in the northwest part of, of the valley. And we can go to that area. Just for or orientation, uh, these section lines, of course, are roads now. And this is 19th Avenue. This is 67th Avenue going north. This is, uh, I think, 113th Avenue. East to west, this is Northern Avenue. This is Bell Road. And this is Joe Max Road right there. So just, uh, just west of Joe Max and 67th, uh, we see here that he has it labeled as King's Dam Site. And this is New River, and there actually is a, a modern dam there now. But these are the east and west, west wing mountains. 
And a fellow by the name of John C. Collier homesteaded this area in 1888. Uh, John, I'm sorry, John King homesteaded the area in 1888, along with a partner by the name of Collier. And they hired uh, Dyer in 1890 to, to help them set this area up as a, a dam. So they were, they were doing the work uh, to, to, to block whatever water there was coming down New River, turn it into a, a water storage area. And that's how they were going to make their money. And then they'd build it and then maybe build canals or sell the water storage area to whoever. Because there were a lot of other schemes that were going on being talked about in various stages of com completion. And one of them, one of them that happened to be the, the biggest scheme, uh, one of the biggest was the Rio Verde Canal Company. And that was kind of a wild scheme. They were taking water from way over on the Verde River all the way to the east edge of the valley and brought some through the mountains, some around the mountains. And their purpose was to irrigate the entire valley north of the Arizona uh, Canal. To do so, they were going to build 150 or more miles of uh, canals. And they're going to have three or four different storage areas. One of the storage areas they really wanted was this exact site that King and Kyer and Dyer had been working on for, for a couple of years uh, in the, uh, kind of a small kind of a, a mom and pop scheme. So when Collier wasn't around one time and King, they, they weren't there, people from the, from the Rio Verde project came in and uh, moved onto their campsite. Or as Dyer later wrote, they, uh, they jumped their claim. So King was not happy about it. And he took a shotgun and, and, and walked into the town didn't, or not the town, into the camp. He didn't get too far before the camp cook shot him in the leg. Uh, he was, he, he, he didn't die, but he was, he was seriously wounded. And I guess that was enough. And he gave the land over to the Rio Verde Canal Company. And Dyer uh, wrote about this in the paper saying what, what bad guys these Rio Verde people were and, and how you couldn't trust him and so on. And he was gonna bring them to court and sue him and all. I don't, he, apparently he never did that. But what he did do when he brought out this map was, was just, just a year later, and the real Verde had started a little bit of construction. They had actually let out a big 50,000 uh, uh, contract to someone. There is actually no hint of, of the real Verde uh, plan on Dyer's map. Uh, and the only thing in this area here is a King's Dam site, which I think you can look at as kind of a memorial to uh, his friend, John King. Dyer, the second project Dyer worked on was right here next, next door to New River on the Agra Fria River. It was on the Agra Fria uh, Land and Water Canal Company. And this was a, a project that was, uh, that was run by the Beardsley brothers, George and William Beardsley. And they were just getting started. They were actually, they were contractors still in 1893, just getting started, beginning to do, do something uh, with the project. Nothing had been built yet. In spite of that, Dyer uh, pulls out, he, 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 he indicated on the map all the different canals that, of the Agra Fria uh, company. He calls this a branch. He calls most of them proposed Agra Fria uh, canals right here. And he points out they had a lower dam, and this is the future Lake Pleasant, and they had another dam up there for that. They even had a dam up there, which, which they didn't use. So anyway, he put all this stuff of the Beardsleys on the map. We don't know why exactly, but it was right at the time this map came out that uh, Dyer was hired by the Beardsleys to, to work on their project. So maybe it's a coincidence or maybe not. But he worked on the project uh, between 1893 and 1895, particularly on this lower dam, which was a smaller dam. The purpose of that, that was the diversion dam that was to let some of the water from the, from the big lake into the uh, Beardsley Canal and other canals. And that 1893, 1895, here's a picture of the dam. Uh, as it was just being completed, they just about had it done. A flood came through and it busted out part of the, of the dam right there. This, this was a big setback for, for the Beardsleys. And they eventually did finish the, 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 uh, the project. They built Waddell Dam and, uh, and the new lower dam, the diversion dam created Lake Pleasant. But it took them 30 years. It wasn't until the 1920s uh, when they were able to, to finish. The, uh, <clears throat> the camp in the 1890s that where people stayed, where, where the workers lived when they built this lower dam, di diversion dam, came to be known as Camp Dyer. And that name was used at the time in the newspapers and for a couple decades later as a, a special election district and so on. It was never officially a town or anything, but people knew that 
that site there where the dam was built as, as Dyer, um, Camp Dyer. In the 1990s, 100 years later, when the Central Arizona Project came through, needed water, and they built New Waddell Dam to raise the levels of, of Lake Pleasant, and they rebuilt the diversion dam, they, they made the name official, and that diversion dam that's there now is called uh, Camp Dyer Diversion Dam, named after C.J. Dyer. Dyer no longer went in the field after uh, 1895. He kind of stayed in town. He did some contracts uh, with the city of Phoenix on some of the streets and curbs. Uh, he also did some contracts with the county roads and he turned to local, local politics. Uh, he, he, uh, he ran for two terms uh, for the city council uh, and was, was elected to both of them. Uh, so he served between 1897 and 1901 and within each term, uh, he served as mayor of Phoenix for a short period. Uh, in 1899, John Adams uh, uh, was Mayor John Adams, quit uh, in, a, in a huff and uh, the fellow city council members named Dyer to, to fill in his spot as mayor until the next election, which was about three months later. In, in 1900, Mayor Emil Gans uh, went on a, an extended visit uh, to see family over in Europe. He was gone about five months. And once again, Dyer was elected by the council members to serve as mayor while Gantz was gone. So Dyer in, in total served on a pro temp, uh, on a temporary basis as mayor of Phoenix for about eight months. And in City Hall in downtown Phoenix, they have a gallery of mayors. They have all the pictures of all the mayors uh, who are, uh, of Phoenix, except for C.J. Dyer. Uh, so we have the photo and now when things get back to normal, we'll be able to go there and uh, present the, the city with uh, C.J. Dyer's photo for the for the uh, for the gallery of city mayor mayors of Phoenix. C.J. Dyer died in 1903 of complications from kidney disease after several months of uh, illness. He he never married. He didn't have any family in town, but he was a very a very popular fig uh, figure, and apparently uh, there was a, a large crowd at his funeral. Uh, you know, although there were over 2,400 different cities who had bird's eye views made of them uh, during the 19th century, as far as I can tell, Phoenix is the only place that was lucky enough to have four bird's eye views done by the same artist within a, a brief period, within an eight year period. I think there's a lot of in, information about life in Phoenix, the late 1880s, early 1890s there. Um, <clears throat> And then, of course, we have some events in, in his uh, personal life, and and the and the views themselves show the progression, the growth of the areas. So, as a draftsman and artist, Dyer left many examples of his handiwork, uh, which relate to the rapid growth of the area. But really, it's his bird's eye views that he made for commercial distribution. They made for profit uh, that really continue to provide researchers and curious observers with interesting insights in his life in life in uh, Victorian. Era Phoenix. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ed. That was a wonderful overview. Um, I, I guess a bird's eye view of C.J. Dyer was the correct title there for sure. Yes, oh, yes. Um, so it was uh, really interesting to see some of the descriptions of those bird's eye views. And I know the in the Prescott one, we were seeing that the, uh, the center plaza area was really that courthouse, the emphasis of that. Um, but there is a question when you, I, I gotta admit, I was shocked when you said they weren't using balloons, they weren't using towers to do no. these bird's eye views. And there was a question out there that was, if a high point was available, um, for example, South Mountain, would Dyer have taken advantage of that at all, do you think? Well, I think, you know, as long as it didn't cost money and didn't take extra time, it's possible. But again, in Dyer's case, remember, he really only had one good eye. So he didn't have a lot of depth perception, you would assume, with one eye. So I think going up in a balloon and going to a hilltop would not really have benefited Dyer as it would have a normal seeing person. So yeah, that's he a that's, doing it. He was better off doing it out of his imagination, which is really, I think, astounding. Um, considering, uh, you know, as a fellow glasses wearer, that's impressive. Um, <laughs> but 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that 1885 map of Phoenix, as you're saying, the colors are great. The city line is phenomenal. And there was a question about the population of Phoenix right there in 1885. And uh, oh. I, I did a little a little digging myself. And I, I think they were saying in like 19 or 1880, it was around like 2,500 uh, yeah. people. It actually says on the map. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's oh, I see. Or I think it's a 3,000 or so by 1890. Okay, perfect. So yeah, around. that population. It's, you know, but it, it, it's right on the map there somewhere. But, uh, his estimate. I right. think that, right. yeah. I think people were really fascinated by that. And you were saying that the, the notes he made on the map were unique to Dyer. Was that something that you were going to see in other markets or? Those, those boxes, there's, yeah. if, you, if you're interested in looking for bird's eye views on the Library of Congress, they have like well over a thousand of them. And you can just, you can check them out. And wow. if you look in the 1880s, you won't see any others that have those little boxes that are explanations of what's going on in, in the map. Uh, there's a few of them about a decade later or, or so. But uh, at the time Dyer was doing it, and again, he was all by himself here. He kind of made these things up and uh, uh, a couple of, of good things there. But they're, they're nice because they, they talk about, I, I see, you know, they talk about what he wanted to, to talk about, which kind of goes in line with what he was showing in, in the map, which goes in line with what was happening in, in the area. Yeah. That, and then the fascinating thing that I, that I was hearing through your presentation and somebody picked up on it, were like these maps primarily sold after they printed, before they printed, and were they sold just locally or was there a national uh, well, you know, buzz for these? That's a good question because the way they did it is they, the, their model was that County Atlas uh, groups and they would actually pre-sell the maps. They, he, would do, uh, he would do partial sketches and then go around the place and say, look, this is what it's going to look like, but imagine it fully colored and fully done. And you know, we can have, you know, and then people would order the map and pay ahead of time, which gave the artist the money to actually order the map. And then, you know, and then, so he, he wouldn't order the map and, until he got to a point where he wouldn't lose any money. And then he would make the maps and then bring them back and sell them. If he had a high demand, he'd probably print more and have some extras left over. If it looked like it wasn't going to go, they just print the ones that were paid for and, and, uh, and move on. But wow. most maps, we believe, were printed in, in one run, for uh, these maps here for Arizona. Right, right. And so uh, you were saying that there was just astronomical amount printed for that Tempe map, the 5,000 yeah. you said. And what, was that common for other places that were other no. states maybe? No, that's what I say. That, that's just huge. It, it could have been uh, part of the part of his salesmanship, you know. Um, yeah. But I'm sure there were more than a, a few hundred because he used it, and you know he went. And if they're anywhere, they're likely to be in Kansas because that's where he really to mm -hmm. really distributed them. It's the only map of Dyer's that uh, that was not intended for the people who lived in the place that's on the map. It was intended for an, an outside market. Um, so, but 5,000, it, it says so in the paper, it, who knows? I just, right, who, where, where are they all hiding, I guess is the yeah, question, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I love the different play of color. Now you're saying that, that he could have made a suggestion about color, but it was up to the printer, is that right? The final, the final decisions were at the printers. Again, these were, there wasn't any place, the, the nearest place to print these maps would have been on the West Coast. And the uh, place that did a lot of them in San Francisco called Schmidt Lithography. They, a lot of the map makers went, went to them. So um, he, would have, he would have given them the sketches of whatever state they were in, probably as good a state as it could be. Then they would transfer them over to Stone because it's uh, lithography. And then he would have like pointed out what colors he wanted and that. And then, but it ultimately left up to the, the people at the lithographers to make the final decisions. So wow. in other words, uh, you know, these artists, including Dyer, have a lot of help along the way. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so that 1885 map, somebody did a real good job over there in San Francisco too. Because yeah. Dyer would not have been able to go back and forth. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that he didn't. He only left uh, Arizona twice after he moved here in 1881. Once when his father died in Michigan oh. in 1885. And a second time when he was very ill 
he went to Los Angeles in uh, 1899. Wow. So he, he definitely didn't go back and follow up on the job. He, he yeah. gave him instructions and, and waited to see how it turned out. Wow. Oh, we do have one more question here. And then it's, have you found any of the original drawings or sketches from which they were produced, these great lithographs? No, no that would be quite a find, though. Um, there are a few known for bird's eye, other bird's eye artists in, in the country. Um, there's a few known, they're, they're, they're very rare, but there are one or two sketchbooks that they kept or, or some of the, of the larger drawings. Mm -hmm. There's a, there are several things of, uh, of Dyer's that are referred to uh, in the newspapers that haven't been found. Uh, there was a, an earlier version of that 1893 map. I, I believe it was, the, uh, I believe it was the prototype, but he made a version of that that was, that was six feet long and, and three and a half feet tall. And that's and that's not been found. He also mm -hmm. has there he has uh, sketches of, of the of the fairgrounds. He has sketches of of the flood of eighteen ninety one. There's a lot of things that Dyer did that we haven't found that they're they're out there somewhere. But again, not a lot has been known about Dyer uh, this whole time. So actually, in about eighteen eighty, uh, one of the researchers, the big guys in uh, bird's eye views thought that uh, he tried and tried, he couldn't find it very much about Dyer, and he said that Dyer was doomed to live forever in anonymity. Oh. Uh, 40 years later, we do know something about him, so that's good. Yeah, and I think that, I think it really holds to the appeal of the bird's eye view. I mean, it's still a gorgeous type of map to look at. I think it's appealing for the researcher and just the average day viewer. So I think there's a lot of appeal there. Yes. Yeah. Some people even have them up on the wall. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There are a great thing for there. And uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, somebody put a Library of Congress link there to the the, the bird's eye map in the in the chat. That's yeah, wonderful. Like panoramic. Yeah, the, terms. Panoramic. Yeah, the Library of Congress website is great for those. But um, I don't see any more lingering questions, but I just want to say I, I this was a great presentation. I loved uh, hearing about CJ Dyer and uh, all of those great maps that we know and love, but uh, maybe didn't know all of that story. So just thank you once again for uh, being here and presenting. And I know everybody is just pouring in the, the love for this presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you everyone for uh, coming and hope you enjoyed it. Excellent. What a wonderful presentation. We're going to end it there tonight.